Okay, airway management, ITLS. So I've already gone through two slides. That's pretty quick. Oh, that's right. uh, 29. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be looking at the respiratory uh, anatomy and physiology. So we're going to be talking about intubation and other ways of airway control. We're going to talk briefly about supplemental oxygen, adjuncts, not so much. Indications, contraindications, advantages, and disadvantages. We're also going to pick up something we talked briefly about it in class back in January, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. It's going to be determining how difficult an intubation is going to be based on some measurements that we'll take on, of your patient. We're going to look briefly at Selleck's maneuver. Really, they've kind of taken that out of our practice. We know what it is. You may give it a, a try, but most of the time we're really not using it anymore. They found that it's really not all that effective for what they thought it would do. We're going to look at the what should be in the airway kit. Uh, airway management is going to be the most important thing that you do for your trauma patient. If you don't manage their airway, nothing else matters. And probably... 80% of the time, you're going to manage that airway as a BLS provider. So if you don't, if you can't properly ventilate your patient with a BVM, it doesn't matter that you can intubate them. If you can't keep their airway open, none of that stuff is going to matter. So your BLS skills, number one, are going to be most important to providing care, airway management for your patient. But number two, when you go to National Register, I can tell you that most of your answers, when it talks about airway control, is still going to be BLS. That's one of the problems that students make, one of the mistakes that they make. So they go to registry, they're looking to make something much harder than it is. So if you can manage your airway at the BLS level, that's what you've got to do. So we're going to be looking at uh, how challenging it may be in the field. I'm not familiar with these slides very much. Time is going to be the most important thing that you do. How long before patients start showing brain damage? Yeah, four to six minutes, yeah. So you've got to get right on it. Four minutes sounds like a lot of time when you're sitting there talking to somebody at lecture. But when you've got a patient that's not breathing, that four minutes moves very quickly because why? You're extremely busy getting your stuff out, positioning your patient, you know, crowd control, whatever else. So there's a lot of things going on there. We do have several options, and I just mentioned the needle <coughs> pipe we're just getting in Alabama. They passed it yesterday, so it's got one or two more hoops. But... Uh, that's something that we'll be able to do. So we're picking up some alternatives uh, when needed. You really could go probably through most of your career without needle cracking somebody. I think I've done it two times. I've done it two times, and that's it. We don't do it in Alabama, uh, but we will. So you could be a long time before you do this. We're also going to be talking about paralytics too, and you can go a long time in your career without doing that. Okay, most of the stuff you already know. Um, why is it important to know the uh, physiology and anatomy of the nose? What does the nose do for us in airway control? Yeah, the usual stuff. But as far as airway control, do what? Yeah, it does all that, but how does it impact our airway control? Yeah, that's very. If it bleeds a lot, yeah, that can interfere with airway. Um, is there any device we may actually put in the nose? Yeah, we can intubate them. You can, you know, do a nasal intubation. If you're not real careful with that, you may tear up this soft tissue in here. Uh, besides down the road, the patient getting an infection out of that, you may get a lot of blood and material that can block the airway. So it's important that you understand how delicate the nose is and uh, be very careful. We're talking about trauma, so if there's ever any hint that there's injury probably above the clavicle, so you probably don't want to use a nasal intubation. Uh, here, when you look at the, uh, the anatomy of the airway, probably one thing we haven't talked about enough is the hyoid bone. Right down here, the hyoid bone attaches, or the uh, epiglossus is attached to the hyoid bone. So that when you're lifting, uh, when, you, when you position the patient properly, you've got the head tipped back, that's going to actually open the epiglottis, so it's going to make it easier for you to do your intubation. And of course, the tongue is attached to the mandible, and that's important when you look at positioning the airway, uh, pulling out the jaw for the jaw thrust, or tipping the head back, as the case may be. Um, this is going to be more important as we talk about crikey, but you need to know, you need to understand the ac uh, absolute anatomy here. Right, what is this structure right here? It's on the board. You can probably read that. The thyroid cartilage, right. Where are the vocal cords compared to a relative to the thyroid cartilage? Yeah, it's right back there. 
Yeah, this whole this whole thing is the uh, the larynx. So that's going to include the, uh, the thyroid. What's this little space in between there that's kind of red? Right through here. Yeah, that's going to be the, your cricothyroid membrane, and then this is going to be your cricoid cartilage right down here. So when you cric, you're going right there in that middle. Um, and this is where, when you're doing the Celex maneuver, you're actually putting your fingers here where this guy has them. All right. Y'all can feel all that on yourself, can't you? Can you palpate your... Uh, your thyroid. All right, I got two bumps here, right? Which one's going to be bigger? Yeah, it's going to be the thyroid. You can see how much bigger that is. So you can palpate that either from the bottom or from the top, but you need to be familiar with those landmarks. When we go to the lab later in the semester, we're going to palpate that on one another. Okay, and this is, this is a great picture, probably the better ones uh, that I've seen. You can see the hyoid bone here. This really tells you that's the level of the epiglottis and the glottic opening. The thyroid, the cricothyroid, right in there. That's a nice little thing. Okay, if there's anything on here that you guys don't know, you're in some serious trouble here. Where does gas exchange occur? At the alveoli. Uh, alveoli. What, is, uh, what is the area where, uh, what is this? area called right here? The carina. That's where, where the uh, trachea bifurcates. Okay. Hmm. Here we're looking at intubation. You know, when you flip the head back, you're actually decreasing slightly the amount of tube that you're going to need. So when it's hyperextended, you don't need, you, you lose about a centimeter there, or two centimeters. All right, so that. You know, when you open a patient's airway, what really are our two choices in opening the airway? Head tilt, chin lift, or the jaw thrust. Sometimes they call it a modified jaw thrust. Do you know what the difference between a modified jaw thrust and the jaw thrust is? It is slightly different. With the regular jaw thrust, um, you're gonna, you can you tip the head back and extend the jaw. With a modified, you're not tipping the head back, so it's going to remain straight. <coughs> Did you notice that they've, uh, of course they would do this anyway, but when you're intubating a patient, it's, it's always a good idea to go ahead and put a cervical collar on them. It keeps them from moving. If you've got a tube in and the head keeps going like this, you run the risk of what? Which one of these? Yeah, the D, displacement. Good job. Once you, uh, when you're managing a patient's airway, somebody has to be assigned to that airway and they watch it at all times. You're monitoring, if they're intubated, you're monitoring for this DOPE, but even outside of that, you're monitoring to see if you've still got good compliance when you're ventilating the patient. What does that mean? Compliance? Yeah, is it easy or hard? If you're trying to ventilate and it's really hard when you're pressing that bag, you've got a problem. So you're going to have to go back and start problem solving that. But what's the one thing I told you about patients, the D word? It's not displaced. They're dynamic. They're always changing. So you have to constantly be watching them and reassessing them for changes. Difficult airways. Okay, we're going to, later in the semester, we're going to talk a whole lot more about RSI. Uh, also called drug assisted intubation. So, really, I think they're kind of aiming for two different things here. We may be able to paralyze a patient, but you also might, rather than paralyze, you may just sedate them, and that might still facilitate intubation. These are, uh, this MMAP, these are different ways that we're going to use to determine how difficult it's going to be to intubate. Why do we need to assess that with a patient before we intubate them? Or say, before we perform rapid sequence intubation? Yeah, if you're not going to be able to get the two after, they're in, after you paralyze them, you're looking for a whole world of trouble, so you need to know going in how difficult it's going to be. Y'all, any of you guys ever gone into surgery? The anesthesiologist comes and meets with you beforehand. Y'all done that? Yeah. First thing they say is open your mouth, you know, and they're looking down in your mouth. And this is what they're looking for. Mainly, at that point, they're looking for this measurement. I think I have them in here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The uh, Malapati score, is that pronounced right? I don't know, one's ever said it for me. 
What they're looking for is when you look in this mouth, and they're going to grade you. A, a four is going to be the, the most difficult. A one's going to be the easiest. So when you look in the mouth, if you can see all of these structures, they're going to be easy. But people with a small mouth, say if you look in there and all you can see are the tonsils that, and the space around here, uh, if you're all you can see, if you can see that, then you've got a good visualization. The mouth opens quite wide. If you can't see that and all you can see is just the top part of this, they're probably going to be a two. If you look in here and you can see the hard palate and the soft palate, you know the difference between the hard palate and the soft palate, right? You can feel it in your mouth. The hard part is up at the front. So if you look in there and you can see all the upper part of the airway, you can see the hard palate and soft palate, there are three. But if all you can see is the hard palate, you're not going to be able to get that intubation. So that's uh, one of the methods that we're going to use. Another one is going to be measurements where, and I mentioned uh, to you the location of the hyoid specifically for this, three, three, and one. So one of the first things you're going to do is take your three fingers, you want to measure from the tip of the chin to the hyoid. And if you palpate, you can find both of your, your uh, thyroid, you can find your thyroid cartilage. Your hyoid bone is going to be that hard place above that. So you'll measure from the tip of the chin and see if you still have some space to the hyoid. If it's less than that, it's going to be a difficult intubation. Um, you'll have them open the mouth. Wait, three, three. Oh, the other one is you're going to measure three fingers. I probably wouldn't be the easiest one. I barely got three. Of course, they don't really say which fingers. Probably the patient's fingers, not your fingers so much. And the one is going to be when uh, they extend the jaw, do they have at least one centimeter between their lower teeth? So that would indicate that you've, they've got decent flexibility there. The Atlanto occipital extension, uh, okay, what is that? Y'all remember reading that? Yeah, no, good. Well, read that up and somebody tell me because all of a sudden I lost it. It says in patients with cervical spine injury is not suspected mobility to extend the head at the Atlanto occipital joint to achieve the sniffing position. Yeah, it's just too easy, sniffing position. Uh, and then also another thing you have to factor in, do they have any little anatomical obstructions, which would be what? What could be an anatomical if obstruction? Any infection or injury. Yeah, if they've got any swelling <laughs> in there. If yeah, see, I typed that in because that wasn't on the original. If anybody's following along, I forgot to put that in there. Yeah, if there's anything that may interfere with you being able to visualize the cords, it's going to be a problem for you. So in this case, if you do these measurements, and the patient doesn't meet the minimum criteria, you're not going to get that tube in. Normal oxygenization. Now, in the olden days, they used to tell us everybody needed 100%. Well, not so much. Now, we're really just ventilating them to keep them at about 95%. It doesn't have to be 98. It doesn't have to be 99. So uh, 95 is, is a good goal. You're going to be monitoring your uh, oxygen saturation on all of your trauma patients. And as we get to the head injury part, this is going to become much more important. We went over this. You guys, of course, need to know this. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, uh, what did it stand for? What is that? Flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device. Yeah. And you can set that so that it goes off like, you know, eight times a minute, ten times a minute, whatever you need. But what's going to be the biggest problem you're going to have with this device? They have improved them a lot in recent years, fortunately. But what's the biggest problem with that device? If you've got a, a mask over the patient's face and it's just set to go off, you set it for, you know, 350 milliliters or 500 milliliters, whatever it is you want to ventilate at, what's your problem there? I feel like the airway. Yeah, yourself. you can't really manage that. If you think about dope here, what's the P? You can't tell when you're getting uh, poor compliance because you're forcing that air in under you know, a significant amount of energy. So you have a difficulty monitoring that airway appropriately. But it's there if you need it. It makes it's a lot easier to do with just one person, whereas with a bag valve ma mask, it's difficult. You know, you may need to know these numbers for the test. I haven't seen the test since they changed it recently. So you may need to know what these are. So glance over those real quick. Is it going to be open book test? Do y'all know? No? Okay. 
Okay, normal ventilation, usually when we breathe, we're exchanging about 400 to 600 cc's. How much is left in dead space? 150, okay, I'm just checking. Do you remember uh, our, uh, the formula for the minute volume? Right here. Yeah, what is it? It's gonna be the number of breaths times your volume, right? That's gonna tell you how much air you're moving in a minute. Which basically tells you if your patient's breathing adequately or inadequately, right? If they're moving uh, 400 cc's with each breath, but they're only breathing six times a minute, are they breathing adequately? If they are breathing uh, 18 times a minute, but they're only exchanging 200 cc's, are they breathing adequately? No, so rate and volume really is what we're talking about here. Uh, it's gonna also tell you if they're breathing adequately or not. So you can see, uh, is that what I just mentioned? Pretty much, mm -hmm. oh, not too bad, pretty good. Good old girl. Normal ventilation, now this is important too because you guys are gonna be using, uh, you know, uh, end tidal CO2 detectors. So you need to know what you're gonna be looking for. Capnography, has everybody got capnography on their trucks now? Yeah, and later in the semester we're gonna be looking at that so that you can recognize those waveforms and you can just see it and know exactly what that means. We talked about that earlier in the last in fall semester, uh, spring semester too. 35 to 40 is the percent, is the uh, pressure that you're gonna want for carbon dioxide. That's normal. If that carbon dioxide rises, what happens to the patient? What, what do they start doing in a normal situation? If this number jumps up to 50, they're gonna start breathing less or they're gonna start breathing more? Okay, as carbon dioxide yeah. rises, they're gonna, they're gonna try to breathe more. They're gonna yeah, they're gonna try to breathe more because they wanna gas easy. that off. They've got too much carbon dioxide, too much acid, so they're gonna try to gas it off, so it's gonna increase their respiratory rate. They wanna say hypoventilation. that's why hypoventilation It means they're not, if they have a high, if it's above 40, that means they're not getting that's enough ventilation. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, the, the uh, the body is going to want to breathe more because they're hypoventilated. Mm -hmm. I thought it was 45. 35. Yeah, 30. yeah, I don't know why they have 40 on here. Yeah, 45 is in the book. Good. I didn't type that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can probably fix that. You're exactly right. It is 35 to 45. Uh, Y'all better write that down. When in doubt, give oxygen. Okay, ventilation rates. Now this, is, this changes from when they're intubated and non-intubated, right? So when they're intubated, you're only gonna ventilate eight to 10 times a minute. You've got complete airway control. They don't need that much oxygen. If they're intubated, they're not running a marathon. You know, they're not stressing over their boyfriends leaving them. So they don't need that much oxygen. <laughs> so fun. Uh, Whereas if they're not intubated, who knows what their situation is, but you, you'll ventilate them a little bit more because you just don't have absolute control. Supplemental oxygen, you always gotta have your suction. Anytime you're ventilating a patient and they're not intubated, one of your greatest risks is gonna be what? Aspiration. Yeah, aspiration, and that happens because you fill the stomach with air. And it's difficult not to have that happen. But if you have a non-trauma patient, you can always do the complete jaw thrust where the head's back and you uh, jut the draw, jut the draw floor, the draw, the jaw, uh, you'll get much better, uh, a better clear flow through there. And I always monitor their lung compliance. You know how you can tell when you're using a bag valve mask that you've lost compliance, right? It's very hard to compress that bag, whether they're intubated or not. When you're pressing that bag and you're having to work harder, you've got an issue. You're probably looking at a pneumothorax. Uh, always use your pulse ox. We'll talk about uh, capnography a little bit later. This later also. How are we doing so far? Okay, there are certain types of patients that you can just tell they're gonna be problems. Uh, what's the problem when you're trying to ventilate a patient who has a, a big heavy beard? You can't get a good mass seal. And as long as that air is scooting out the side, you're going to have difficulty in, uh, in managing the airway. 
if they're very large, what's the problem with very obese patients? Yeah, usually that uh, their airway is very anterior and very, something about all that tissue kind of moves it, makes it very anterior, so it's harder to get a direct shot uh, down the airway. Older patients, usually you lack that flexibility. Uh, you also have uh, teeth problems with older patients. Uh, toothlessness can be a problem because you just can't get a good seal. You don't have any support system around there. That's why if they've got their dentures in and they're secure, you want to leave those in. It's going to help you uh, get a better mass uh, uh, seal. And if they're snoring or drider, that means you've got an airway obstruction of some sort to manage. Your airway kit, you should have all of your stuff. When you, anytime you suspect that a patient may have an airway problem, which would be any chest pain, I'm always going to have my airway kit. Any respiratory distress, I'm always going to have all my airway stuff. Anytime you go in with a patient, you should carry all of your stuff. You just don't want to have to run back to get airway control stuff. So carry this stuff in with you. But you're always going to have your suction. You're always going to have your, uh, your SAT monitor, uh, all of your intubation stuff, oxygen, BBM. How many sizes of BBM do you have to have? You've got to have three, yeah. So you don't want to be uh, bagging that five-year-old with that adult mask and that adult BBM. So make sure you've got the proper equipment. Uh, you know, because the public's watching. They all have video cameras. Now, you can't video any of your patients, but they can video you. So you've got to remember that in the back of your mind that they're taping everything you do. So. Make sure you've got all your equipment so you don't have to run back and get it. Make sure you're using the right equipment. Ensuring a patent airway is essential, absolutely essential. It's the most important thing you're going to do patient care-wise. So make sure that you do it well. We're going to spend a lot of time working on that this semester. Make sure you're proficient. If at any time you feel like, I'm not real sure I could crack a patient if I had to, or I haven't intubated a patient in eight months, you know, if you start feeling that insecurity, you just need to get your medical director. They will get you in somewhere uh, where you can either practice in a lab or get some live contact if you need that. So if you're feeling like that, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, letting your med medical director know so he can help you with that. Okay. Can we pick up some time there? <laughs>